Uh, the last time I was here I, in speaking to you was a couple of Sundays ago, and uh, I just enjoyed that so much. And uh, uh, two great grandboys came down and accepted the Lord that day, and uh, we had been talking with them for a good while and sharing with them, and they have their devotions every night, and they were asking questions. And uh, I remember it started uh, some time back when we had the Lord's Supper, and they came by, and Mason started to reach his hand up there to get the bread, and I pulled his hand back a little bit. And I knew that would cause some questions about the Lord's Supper and why he couldn't participate in that. And uh, so one thing led to another. They finally came and were baptized, and we had talked to them, and uh, I told Mason when we were talking about him being saved that the Lord's Supper, it was for people that were saved and that were baptized. And so... Uh, we came in last Sunday, and we had Lord's Supper here. And uh, I laughed. Mason came, and he came down here, and he pointed at it. And he said, showed it to me, and he's shaking his head, yes, he can do that this time. And one of the great privileges, uh, we sat there, and uh, Jackson was at his father's that weekend. But he sat right there beside me, and I asked him, I said, do you know what that means? And he said, yeah, that bread is the body, and the juice, that's the blood of Jesus. And what a blessing it is that we can be saved. It's not hard, is it? It's not hard at all just to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. I told the Sunday school class this morning, isn't it natural for a child to be a Christian when they're in a Christian family and they watch all the things and they see all the things? It's just natural that they would see, receive the Lord as their Savior, isn't it? So thank you for uh, allowing me to speak again tonight. Our pastor, remember him in prayer and I can't help but think about all those people in the mountains. I see those pictures, and I am so bothered by the devastation that's there and what's happening. And I know many of you have been giving and doing, and well, there going to be, there's going to be a lot of work to do. Just keep those people in your prayers and in your thoughts. I like Brother Marty today. Did an excellent job, didn't he? I said amen a couple of times, and when he said, I don't like long-winded preachers, I said amen too. <laughs> it reminded me of a story. There was a preacher one time, and he was a young preacher, and he got called to a church, <clears throat> and uh, it was his first Sunday. He moved in the parsonage beside of the church, and it was in the Midwest, and a big snow came that day. And... Uh, he didn't know what to do, so he got dressed. He went on out to the church, and he waited, and he waited, and he waited. Nobody came until finally, right at the time to start, one old farmer walked in, and he looked at him, and they talked for a few minutes. He said, well, he said, it looks like it's just going to be me and you. He said, uh, do you want me to preach today? And the farmer said, well, you know, when I go to feed my cows, if only one cow comes up, he said, I'm going to feed him. And the preacher grinned and said, well, we're going to preach today. And he got a little excited, you know, and he preached and he preached. And he preached some more and some more and just went on and he was just excited. And when the service was over, he went to the back door to greet the one farmer that was there. And he said, uh, well, what did you think of the message today? He said, well, you know, if I had cows and only one of them came up to eat, I would feed him. But he said, I wouldn't try to give him the whole wagon load. <laughs> so I'm not going to give you a wagon load tonight, okay, just, just a little bit. Well, let's get into the book of Ephesians. What a great book that is. And uh, as we look at this, I want to show you a few things in chapter 1, and then we'll go to chapter 2. And as we think about this, you know, I am learning, and the Bible uses the term uh, mystery sometimes that God is revealing to us certain things. It's like it was a mystery, but he's showing us those truths. And then sometimes he uses a term like in the book of the Revelation, it's veiled, it's covered up, and we can't see and we can't know. But through time and study and his word, he reveals himself to us. Well, I understand a little bit about my salvation. I, I think we've all grown in that, and we understand the, the beauty of just being saved and being forgiven of our sins. But then the question comes, what does God think about us? Have you ever thought about that? What does God think about his children? And we'll look at this and we'll see a couple of things in it. I want to begin with verse 17 of chapter 1. That the God of our Father, Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, 
may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Paul is praying. He says, I'm praying that they will understand. Give them the knowledge and understanding. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. That is the first thing. What is he talking about? He's talking about the certainty of where you're going, your heavenly home, your destiny that you're going to. That's the hope of your calling. And the, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, not for the saints, but in the saints. What is that talking about? That's talking about uh, the realization of the priceless value of our salvation. We begin to understand that. But there's a second part of that, and that is what a priceless treasure we are to God. Now, I don't feel like a priceless treasure, do you? But God tells us a few things about ourselves that we need to know because it will help us in our behavior and help us in how we live. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power? What is he talking about there? He's talking about the things that we receive from God when we're saved, the change that's taken place at conversion, and how we experience his divine strength in our daily living. He's there with us every day, isn't he? He changes our life. He gives us the strength and the power to do the things that he's called us to do. And then verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. That is a power. God had the power to raise Jesus from the dead. And the next couple of verses, you can, she's going to put them up there on the screen, he's over everything, principalities, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. He has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. He gives us a picture here of Jesus Christ, the power that he has, and he talks about how God is revealing himself to us and how God feels about us. Well, we'll look at some of these verses in this next chapter. Most of the time when people speak about Ephesians chapter 2, there's that grace verse that's in there, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself, it's not anything we work up, but it's a gift of God, isn't it? And that's a great verse, but I, I, we won't spend too much time on that. I just quoted it to you. But let's look at some of these other things that I want you to get out of this chapter. The first thing I want you to know is that God has freed us. He's quickened us. Listen to how he describes this. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin, Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of there, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. He's telling us who we used to be, okay? We were children of the devil. That's what it says, of darkness. Uh, we minded ourselves. We were influenced by him, among whom also we had our conversation in times past and the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. We were selfish, weren't we? And that's where we were when we were unbelievers. We didn't want God to run our life. We wanted that privilege ourselves, and it gets us in a lot of trouble. And then we come to this great verse. Listen to verse 4. But God, thank goodness that verse is in there. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. That tells you why he's done all these things is because he loves you. The Bible says about God, what does it say? God is love. That's a character. That's the essence of God. The Bible says he's a spirit. He, he doesn't have a body. He doesn't need a body. Jesus took on one when he came here so we could see him, acknowledge him, and know him. But the Bible says about God, he is love. That is who he is. Even when we were dead in sins. He hath quickened us together with Christ. He saved us, folks. He changed our life. And what a great thing that is. And what does it mean to us when we come to him and our sins are forgiven? Well, I like the first verse in Romans chapter 8. That eighth chapter is a wonderful chapter. But listen to this. Therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation, 
to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Did you get that? There is no condemnation to you. I don't feel like that I ought to be free from condemnation, but God says you're free from it because you've been washed in the blood. Now, does that mean I'm perfect? No, that doesn't mean I'm perfect. But that means God washed me, saved me, he made me one of his children, and now there is no condemnation. God, our preacher said it the other day, he paid for our sins past, he paid for our sins present, he paid for our sins future sins. We are forgiven. And God wants us to know that because he doesn't want us to live back where we used to be. When we understand who we are in Christ Jesus, listen, it frees us. It gives us, and Paul wrote over and over about the freedom that he had in Christ. Sin no longer has dominion over us. We're free to worship him and to be, and thank goodness he accepts us and loves us. And that, that, uh, thing that was between us and God, that enmity, the Bible says, that, uh, that uh, broken relationship, that relationship that didn't exist, it now exists because of what Christ did for us on the cross. I, I am so grateful for that. He has saved us, and he has quickened us, and he made us a child of God. I like the 33rd verse in that same chapter. Listen to this. Now that you're saved, listen to what it says. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect. He asked a question. Who in the world is going to make an accusation against the children of God? Is, it is God that justifies. He is saying, you know, the Satan loves to accuse you. The Bible says about him, he is the accuser of the brother. He'll tap you on the shoulder. He'll say, you sin. You ain't no good. God can't use you anymore. You may as well give up the Christian life because that's who you are. You can't make it. But God says you made it. You've been washed in his blood. You're saved. And he says in this verse, he asks the question, who can lay any charge to the elect of God? And the answer to that is nobody. Nobody can lay any charge. God defeated Satan on the cross of Calvary, and he gave us freedom in Christ. Listen, I'm grateful for that. Some people say, well, what about if I sin? Well, you're not going to quit sinning when you've got to be a Christian. It's just not going to happen. I, I, I just don't believe that. Some people think that when you're saved, you become perfect. And I, I like the thought of this. You know, I couldn't save myself. It was impossible. And I can't keep myself. If it's up to me, I am not going to be able to save myself. I can't keep myself. I like the thought when he's talking about walking with God. Listen, I'm holding on to him, but he's holding on to me. A lot of times my grip loses and I, I, I can't hold on but he holds on to me. It's his responsibility, folks. Thank goodness he saved us. Thank goodness he did what we could not do for ourselves. It would be impossible to do that. And, and Paul, in this book of Ephesians, he reminds us who we are, that we're saved and we've been set apart for Christ and we are going to be protected by him and one day we're going to reign in heaven with him. He goes farther and he says something else. Now, this is something you might not have been taught before. But what about the position that he's put you in? You see, we sing songs like, uh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. I'm a dirty, downright old sinner that's saved by grace. You know, we really put ourselves down. Is that the way God feels about you? Is that the way God feels about you? You may feel that way sometimes, but God does not feel that way about you. He loves you. He saved you. You're one of his children, and he is in charge of keeping you. I, I like that thought. Does it mean that we're free to sin? Absolutely not. Does it mean that we won't pay a penalty for our sin? Well, sure we will. Sin in itself has a penalty. If you don't believe that, go out and kill somebody, and this society will put you in jail. They might even execute you for that sin. Sin has a penalty. But thank goodness for the Christian. Christ paid for our penalty on the cross of Calvary. But now listen to this next verse. Listen, listen closely in chapter 2 because uh, he's quickened us, verse, verse number 5, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. That's the first thing he's done, he's quickened us. And hath raised us up. Now notice that he didn't say we'll raise you up. He said he hath raised you up. You see that? Big difference in those words, isn't it? He hath raised us up to sit together 
and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, that's what God thinks about you. He already sees you sitting with him in heaven. Now, I don't feel that way. I feel pretty sinful. I feel pretty dirty most of the time. But God is saying to his children, do you understand who you are? You are a child of the Most High God. And he says to us, he has raised us up. That's how God sees us. That's what he says. That's how, I, how he sees us. He sees us as already there. We're there with him. And why did he raise us up? Why has he positioned us that way? Listen, it's, it's, it's kind of twofold. When you were saved and then you were baptized, you know, you were brought up out of that grave, that watery grave, and you were given a new life in Christ Jesus. The Bible says we're new creations in Christ. He's given us a new start. Thank goodness all that old things of the past are forgiven. They're under the blood. Amen. We don't have to deal with those. We might have to deal with them in this life with people and things, but God has forgiven us. And the Bible says when he forgave us, he cast it into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered against us anymore. Now, I might remember it. Satan will remember it, and he'll tap me on the shoulder and remind me, but God doesn't remember. He has forgiven me. And thank goodness for that. I don't have to live in condemnation anymore. There is no condemnation. I just read in those that are in Christ Jesus. Well, why would he set us? Why would, why would we be positioned that way? That's the way he sees you because you're his children. And that's part of it. And, and he brings us, what he's doing, he's bringing us into an intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he's doing. He's bringing us to himself. And why would he do that? Why would he, why would he do that? I just scratch my head and say, why would, why would God view us that way? Why would he look at us and set us in heavenly places there with Christ Jesus? Why is his attitude, why does he see us that way? Well, look at this next verse. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. He is beginning a process of showing you what it's like to be a child of God. Now, I know what it's like to be a child of the devil because that's where I used to be, okay? I know what it's like to feel the guilt, the shame. I know what it's like to go to bed at night and not know where I'm going to go if I die. I know what all that's like. But he's trying to show us what we are in Christ Jesus and who we are since we've been forgiven and we're one of his children. He says he's going to make us to sit in heavenly places with him. And he wants to show his exceeding grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I like that. He makes us that. I, I love the book of Acts. And you remember we've been studying that in chapter 7 of the book of Acts. There's a story there. Listen, God is proud of his children. God is proud. Are you proud of your children? Do you like to look? I mean, do you get great joy out of your children? Huh? Well, don't you think our Heavenly Father loves His children? Listen, He knows we're going to stumble. He knows we're going to fail. But boy, does He love us irregardless of that. And He sees us, and thank goodness He sees the best for us. What about Stephen? Do you remember Stephen in the Bible that got stoned to death? He was the first martyr in that New Testament church. He was a deacon. didn't take him long after he became a deacon. They took him out and stoned him to death. But listen to this verse, <clears throat> chapter number 7, verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And then they cried with a loud voice, and they stopped their ears, and they ran upon him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their coats at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Did you pick up where Jesus was? Jesus wasn't seated at the right hand of the Father. What was he doing? He was standing. That's what the Bible says. He was standing. Why was he standing? Because one of his children was finally standing up down there, and he was giving his life for the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus is standing there. Listen, he's proud of Stephen that day. He is proud of Stephen. Sometimes I think we think about God as being such an angry old man, and we forget how much he loves us. Listen, 
The fact that he loves us doesn't dismiss our sin. It doesn't dismiss any of that. But thank goodness we're loved and we're accepted into Christ. And he cares for us. And, and listen, he watches over us. When I read that about Stephen, I said, God, he loves us. He cares for us. Well, when we think about that, I want you to see something else in this book of Ephesians. I want you to see in chapter number, or verse number 10, he has a purpose for me too. We talked about that the other Sunday when I spoke. Uh, God has a plan. I believe he has a plan. I believe he has a purpose for everyone. But look at what he says about this. And that, let me read that verse again. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But here's your purpose, listen to it. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. That's what God has called you to do. He has something for you, folks. Listen, the fact that God loves us and cares for us and has called us into his family and he wants us to, to be involved in his work. And he is proud of us, just like we're proud. Listen, I fail. I fail, but thank goodness every once in a while I stand up for Jesus. I'm trying to tonight. I'm doing my best. And I believe that God encourages us. I believe God loves us. And that's what God wants us to be about. He wants us to be involved. He wants us to celebrate some victories here. Thank goodness when somebody comes and they give their heart and life to the Christ, it's not one person. It's the church family. It's that we love them and we care for them and we embrace them. And, uh, oh, my goodness, we're, we're all involved in that. And what a wonderful thing it is. As we think about this minute, his purpose for me, I want you to, I, I, I won't go into the night. We've already talked about your calling. God's called you. He has something for you. And the Bible that tells us that in the church of Jesus Christ, he gives spiritual gifts to everybody that's here. He gives everybody at least one gift. That's what the New Testament teaches. He doesn't give anybody all the gifts. So we're all needed. We all work together as a church family. As a, and, and that's what our job is. Now, Paul goes into something else here that I like. We've been studying in the book of Acts, and we've been studying about the Jews, and we've been studying about the Gentiles. And we saw how the church, the first church, pulled out from the Judaism, and now they're beginning to function as a Christian church. They're not Jews anymore. And they had a great big discussion, remember, about circumcision. And the Jews said, well, you've got to be circumcised. You've got to be under the law. You've got to do all that stuff. And, and Paul, remember, he, they went back to the Jewish temple and the council there, and they came back and they said, no, you do not have to be circumcised to be saved. You don't have to be Jewish to be saved. And Paul addresses that a little bit here. I want you to look at how he does this. He says, Wherefore, remember that ye be in past times Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. He's saying the Jews say you're uncircumcised. They believe that you can't be saved. But look at what he says here in verse 12, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, that's where the Gentiles were. They weren't under the covenant. That law wasn't given for them. They weren't part of the Abraham covenant that God had given. And, and Paul is saying here, you were without anything. You were alienated from the Jews. You were alienated from God. But look at what God did. Now, this is a good part here. But now in Christ Jesus... Ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. God is increasing the size. He's opening the doors to the church, and he's saying not just Jews. He's saying anybody and everybody, whosoever will come, and you can be saved, and you can be a part of God's family. And look at how he did it. For he is our peace, speaking about Jesus, who hath made both one, that's the Jews and the Gentiles, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. See, there was something that was standing in the way of that. You look at it, and as we've been studying in our Sunday school, we, we saw that. I mean, the, the Jews just despised the fact that they 
let the Gentiles in the church. And they kept wanting to say, you gotta, you got to be circumcised. you got to be Jewish. you got to do all these things. you got to become a Jew, and then you can be saved. And Paul is saying, look, Christ broke down that petition wall. What was that petition wall? It's going to surprise you. Listen. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of the commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. He did away with that. Now, you got to think for a minute. Does it mean that the law is not relevant to us today? Well, sure it is. You ought to keep the Ten Commandments. But listen, what he is saying, that was what they were using to keep the Gentiles out. They said they can't come in here. They can't keep the law. They can't. Be, they got to go back to that Abraham covenant. They got to be circumcised. They got to do all those things. And, and Paul is saying absolutely not. God took that away. Listen, Jesus didn't come to undo the law. They asked him that one day. He said he didn't come to undo the law, and he didn't. But he said, I came to fulfill the law. He fulfilled the law. You see what the law was, and, and Paul discussed this elsewhere in the New Testament. He said the law can never save a person. All it does is lets you know that you're a sinner. And if you look at the law and you go by that, you understand you cannot live up to that. You can't keep that law. You might have thought you could till Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount, and then he did away with any inkling that you might have done that. Because you know what he said? He said, not only are you guilty if you murder somebody, he said, if you even think it. Isn't that what he said? If, a, if you hate a man, you're guilty of murder. He said, you don't have to have adultery. You don't have to do that. All you have to do is think about it, lust about it, and you're guilty of that sin. You know what Jesus did? He said, it's not only your actions, it's your thoughts too. Now, does anybody feel like you've kept all the commandments? Do you feel like you can keep the commandments now? Can you keep your mind clean? Can you keep that? Thank goodness for the blood of Jesus. And Paul is saying when Christ came, he took down that petition wall. Now the Jews, the Gentiles, they can come together and they can worship. Look at what he says. For to make himself of twain one New man, so making peace. It's not Jew and Gentile anymore, it's one. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity therein. In other words, he's done away with those things that kept us from fellowshipping together. And now the Jew, now the Gentile, and I love what the New Testament says, anybody, whosoever will come, they can come. And we, we, they're not turned away. If you're willing to repent of your sins, if you're willing to ask Christ into your life, make him the Lord of your life, you can be saved. And Paul is saying he's made one out of that. He's talking about the church, folks. That's what he's talking about. And he came and he preached peace to you which were far off and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. And the last thing I want to share with you, I want to tell you that you're possessed okay possessed you think about people being possessed you think about them being demon possessed don't you well we're possessed as christians listen how he puts it now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of god do you see that he calls us saints do you feel like a saint that's what god says about you and listen you better not argue with somebody when they're bragging on their children had you That'll get you in big trouble. You better not say much to them when they're bragging on your ch their children. God is saying, listen, they're my children. I bought for them. I paid for them. I saved them. They are somebody. You may not think so, but they are somebody. And I have a place for them. They're here seated with me in heaven. That's the way I view them. And I'm showing them off. That's what he said, the exceeding riches that he would show the world what it's like. Thank goodness there's a difference between the non-believer and the Christian. If there weren't a difference, why in the world would anybody want to be a Christian? Why? Well, let's go a little farther here. He's fellow citizens and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. He's saying he's building his church. He's building a family. He's building children that are coming to him, and they're built on all these things, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth into a holy temple in the Lord. 
Now think about something. In the Old Testament, do you remember Moses built the tent and they put the Ark of the Covenant in there and the smoke would come and it signified God's presence. There was a temple in the Old Testament for God. Now in the New Testament, let me tell you what happens. It's not a temple that's going to contain God, is it? This house is not going to contain God. But God has a people for his presence today. God dwells in his people. You can't destroy the church. You tear this building down. You tear every church building down. That doesn't do away with the church, does it? Because he lives in us. He lives in his children. And look at this last verse. In whom ye also have builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. That's who you are. You see, God loves you. And he occupies you. Have you thought about that? The Bible says you are in Christ and Christ is in you. That's the hope of glory, the Bible says. And when we think about that, that's who we are. It's priceless, isn't it, to, to think about that. I want to go back to that book of uh, Romans. And I want to give you one more thing and you just let you think about this for a minute. You think, well, why would God do all those things for us? Paul is saying, I want you to understand how much God loves you. And I want you to understand what he has done for you and what he's going to do for you and how he cares for you. And in the book of Romans, it gives it to us this way. And in verse, uh, that same chapter 8, verse, it's not 13, it is 32. Now listen to this. He that spared not his own son, you know who he's talking about, right? God didn't spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. He said one day Christ is coming to the cross and he's going to die. He didn't spare him. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He kind of starts, you know, we like to build up. We like to start with a small thing, add another thing, another thing, and we get to big things. What the writer here does, he starts with the biggest thing. He says, if God gave you Jesus Christ and he didn't spare him, why would he withhold anything in the world from his children? Why would he withhold it? Now, I, wanna, I, I just want to kind of conclude this up, and I want you to think about something. That's a little different teaching for some of you, isn't it? That God loves you and God cares for you. God, has, God sees you as being in heavenly places, seated with him. That's what the scripture says, isn't it? And he wants to show the whole world. He wants to show his goodness. He wants to show us that he's a good father. He wants to show us that he loves us. Listen, folks, it's natural for us to do that with our children, isn't it? Talk to, talk to a grandmother about their grandchildren, and they'll tell you how much they think of them. They'll tell you how much they love them. God, our Father, loves us. Why did he come? Why did he die on the cross? Because he's building for himself a family, a family. And he wants you to be a part of his family. Now, I, don't feel like, I don't feel like what God just said about me. But I know it's true because that's what he said. And I trust his word more than I trust my feelings. And when I get down in the dumps and I feel like I've failed God and I feel like I'm worthless and I feel like I'm useless and I've disappointed myself, I need to be reminded of what God thinks about me. Does it surprise God when we sin? No, it doesn't. God knows everything, doesn't he? But he still loves us. Does that surprise you that God still loves us and cares for us? You see, most things in life, they love me if I love them. If I don't disappoint them, they love me. Sometimes parents and grandparents, well, you have to be careful with your kids. You have to be careful when you show disappointment in them. You know, I, I, I love the fact that God loves me. I think about that and I say, uh, I'm undeserving of that. I'm not worthy of that. But I tell you what it'll do. When you understand how much God loves you, it'll make you a lot more aware that you don't want to disappoint him. I heard a story about a young girl and she was out and some boys were trying to get her in some trouble. And they said, I know what's wrong, why you won't do that. You'll go home and... Uh, you, you, your father, you're afraid of your father, of what he might do for you. And she said, no, that's not it at all. She said, I'm afraid that I will disappoint my father. And that's why I'm not doing it. You see, God wants us to worship him and love him. 
not because we're afraid that he's going to smack us every time that we go around. People that have that belief, I'm going to tell you what, they feel like they can never do anything right. They feel like failures. And listen, we fail plenty of times, but God loves us. He sees us as victors in the Lord Jesus Christ. What does he say? Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Does that sound like a victim to you? Doesn't sound like a victim to me. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Does that sound like a person that doesn't have any ability or can't do anything? No. It sounds like somebody that is empowered by the Lord Jesus Christ, that we've given our heart and life to him. And listen, I don't have much to give him. He has a whole lot that he's given me, hasn't he? Oh, my goodness. He's full of riches. He's full of glory. And thank goodness he loves us. What a great thing. I, I don't know. I feel like God sometimes would rather us worship him and do what we do out of love than out of fear. I don't want my kids to fear me, do you? I don't want them doing everything because they're afraid they're going to get in trouble, get beaten or whatever. You know, I, I don't want them to do that. I want them to serve and to do the things that they do because they love us. And God, Paul is just drawing this picture here. He's pulling back the curtain. He says, you understand a little bit about what God has done for you. You understand your salvation. But do you understand what God has in store for you, what he's done for you, and what your future is with him? And we kind of come out of that and say, God, you have done so much for me. I, I just don't want to disappoint you. Well, that's the message tonight. I, I don't know why God led me to that passage, but I just feel like some of you just don't have a full view of how much God cares for you and loves you and what he has in store for you. I'm used to in this world, if I fail, I get punished. If I fail in this world, I don't get any, I don't get any awards. I don't get anything. I'm shunned in this world if I'm not careful. Jesus Christ loves you. You can't do anything to make him love you more. Do you understand that? And you can't do anything to make him love you less. Does that mean you ought to sin? No. You ought not to sin because you love him and you understand how he feels about you. That ought to be the biggest motivation for you to love him and serve him. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. Well, let's sing a song or play, play. Danny, won't you come? And uh, we'll just play a song. And I wonder if you'll stand with me. And we'll give an invitation. And I don't know what to ask you to do, except uh, maybe some of us need to just be aware how much God cares. And uh, when Satan comes and he reminds us of our failures and he makes us think God's going to be really, really disappointed in us. I, I, I don't feel that way, folks. I just don't look. I look at that scripture and I say, God loves us. He died for us. Why did he die for us? Because he knew we was going to sin. He knew we needed a Savior. And he's just waiting for us. He's our cheerleader. I looked at Stephen and I said, God is watching. God is watching, and he sees all the bad things. I know that. But listen, he sees a lot of good things out of his church family, too. There's great love in this building. There's love and there's care, and, and I believe God sees the bad, but, boy, I believe he sees some of that good. There's some of you that have such a pure heart that you love the Lord. You want your family to love the Lord. You want lost people to come to the Lord. You look at that mountain situation and you wish in your heart you could change that. You have compassion. You see, and, and God is changing your heart and he's making you like himself. Well, let's play, Danny. Let's have a prayer first. Lord, thank you for being with us tonight. And Lord, I just can't grasp all of what I said. Seems foreign that God would love us that much. That God would have placed those things in our life and, and given us that position in life. But Lord, you've done it because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. And we just come tonight and we say thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. And thank you for allowing us to be your children. We ask it in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Have a need. You can